yeah, I mean, this, this talk is uh, really from the perspective of a, a field archaeologist um, who principally works on urban sequences out in the, in the field, although my field is predominantly made of concrete. Um, I'm, I'm not really a technophile nor a complete Luddite, um, as we'll probably find out. Um, Guy felt it would be good to get a digger's input into the debate on um, the use of technology in um, field excavation. Um, I wrote the initial ab abstract after a conversation with Guy when we were working together last year at LP Archaeology. And um, as with all things, it's evolved into something more or less completely different, so you can probably completely ignore the abstract that's written in the, uh, in the resume. Um, what I'd like to talk about is some of the issues around technology on site. Um, from my perspective as a digger, using London as an example, and London's quite a kind of um, a good example in many ways, as hopefully you'll see. Um, and we'll get onto a case study of where we've been, we being LP Archaeology, been successfully using new technology. Um, first off, I think it's worth giving a brief kind of rundown of London's archaeological landscape. Um, in terms of how we analyse, how we excavate and analyse our sites, um, rather than the fact that the Romans got here in AD 43 and built the bridge. Um, so, London's archaeological sites um, can actually be rural or urban in nature. Um, they may be large or small, complex or simple. <coughs> However, within the historic core of London, which is essentially the, the square mile of Roman London and uh, the areas of uh, Westminster, Tower Hamlets, ha um, Hackney and Southwark and Lambeth that were occupied by the end of the uh, 16th and 17th century. That's kind of historic centre. All the other place names of uh, Chiswick, Fulham, um, Lewisham, those were all villages until quite recently. Um, but the excavations within the historic core are often typified by complex sequences of stratigraphic units, um, which are often highly truncated um, by later activity and which may be several metres in thickness. And those sequences have been laid down um, over nearly 2,000 years of almost continuous occupation. Since the 20th century, these sites have been scientifically excavated with increasing uh, regularity by a number of different organisations, both uh, based out of various museums and out of uh, contracting organisations over the last uh, 40 years. Um, it's the excavation of these sites that led, in part, to the development of single context recording um, from its origins in Winchester, um, coming from the work of Edward C. Harris, and um, who created the Harris Matrix and um, developed as a system that allows quick and efficient recording and excavation of complex archaeological sequences and the reconstruction of those sequences in post-excavation, or PX, um, through the drawn, written and photographed record allied with the finds and, and samples. Now, the Museum of London took single context and developed a systems-led approach to excavation and post-excavation, um, which is rigorous, logic-based, um, follows Harris's rules of stratigraphy, and fortuitously uh, was ideally suited to both computer databases, which of course were quite big um, back then, quite a long time ago, and are still big now, and in later years to GIS. <coughs> At the heart of the MOL PX system is a process of aggregation of stratigraphic units into ever larger units. Um, this is done on a many-to-one basis. Thus, uh, contexts are mapped into subgroups. This is done purely on stratigraphic um, relationships. <coughs> um, subgroups are then mapped into groups once we have additional information from uh, specialist reports um, and from the stratigraphic analysis. Um, and the groups um, are then allocated to land uses. And this system takes us from having 50,000 contexts through to having a smaller number of handleable land uses, and those land uses form the basis for essentially writing the publication, the story, as we call it in London. Um, 
this is all, all, all of this um, is mapped into a uh, database which can be linked to GIS. Um, the initial data entry is generally done by the supervisor on the site following the checking of the field records. Plans are still um, hand-drawn nearly all of the time and are digitised, <coughs> although um, companies do use GPS and EDM for some um, site surveying. Um, data entry of the context data is usually done following the digitising of the site plan so that you have a CAD drawing or a GIS project which has got your spatial data in there um, so that you can continuously test it as you're actually inputting in. Um, so preferably we want to have all of our polygons, our, our context outlines put into um, the uh, GIS project before we start doing any higher level um, analysis. And with the Museum of London system, um, which was really developed by Pete Roxlow um, in the later, later years, building on the work of um, various other people at the Museum of London, um, the tasks flow along a predefined pathway through to assessment and analysis. And each stage in post-excavation, quite importantly, also helps to prepare for the next stage. Um, and this, this has created a... An, an elegant and efficient system. It's a system that effectively checks itself as you go forward. Um, various units work within London, but mostly they use a variant of the Museum of London methodology and PX system. And this has you know, obviously created a true single site approach to the overall site of London and potentially provides a unique opportunity for assessing, comparing and analysing the data from, from London. Um, the system works and has been shown to work over several de decades on a huge variety of sites, from waterfront sites to um, Paleolithic sites to, um, to uh, deeply stratified urban sequences through to cemetery sites. Um, we now have a massive data set which has all been collected, assessed and analysed using very similar methods. And... Um, just to underline the fact that the, the methodology hasn't, uh, although it's developed, it hasn't changed that much. You can take um, the original Unix database files um, from the mid-80s, <coughs> chuck those into um, the MOLAS Oracle database, and it will still follow um, exactly the same system and can be brought up to the modern um, way of doing things very easily. Um, and that's something that <coughs> I've done on, on several sites. Um, in PostEx, we're using uh, CAD, GIS, and databases to manipulate the data and to create shape files, and from the shape files up to illustrations. Um, however, aside from in geomatics and in the last few years, digital photography, we still yet tend to use technology for the most part in PostEx rather than out on site. So, what we want to really look at is whether there's a way of utilising technologies on site to improve what we already do. Because if it doesn't, or if it doesn't improve the current systems in some way, then there's, uh, there's not a great deal of point of employing it for the sake of it, unless we get some benefit. We've experimented in the past with digital planning and um, often found problems with that compared to traditional um, draftsmanship on on, uh, on permatrace. So ideally we can, we can enhance the current methods with, uh, that we use with some simple technologies. And a lot of those have been around for a long time. However, it's possible that now technology has finally caught up with where we wanted it to be 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And with Wi-Fi, affordable, portable computers, data loggers, smartphones, tablets, we can actually get the technology out into the field um, and onto smaller sites um, where we want it. So, some of what we can do nowadays, and we're increasingly doing, is um, we can establish GIS projects for, in advance for any medium or large site before we actually get onto site. And this can be the, the information that we gather as part of um, the desk-based assessment process for any site um, can be fed straight through into a GIS project for the excavation. So you can walk onto site 
and you know what all of your historic maps are, you've got them geo-referenced already, you know where the <coughs> Roman roads are, you know where the other sites of the thousands of sites that have been excavated in London, the other sites are in relation to you. And that means that you can actually make more better informed decisions on site um, than if you walked onto site with just uh, a stack full of paper um, ready to dig some holes and then have to go back to the office if you want to see uh, where Watling Street is in relation to you. So we can also add in HER data potentially um, and there is the potential for, for making really the most of the fact that London is one single site with uh, a large number of individual excavations on it. We can also now take onto site um, updated uh, kind of e-library or wiki of useful archaeological information, references, guides, articles, um, files of, of uh, links to websites so that we can quickly uh, obtain um, information from from web resources and we can also use um, uh, technology to allow us to bring manuals which uh, in the past many of you may have seen the, uh, the red book the MOLAS site manual um, we can bring that out um, onto site using um, tablet or phone technology and actually have people not <coughs> passing around paper copies of lots of information but having it on their phone potentially um, these are some training materials that I've been writing that will be published um, as PDF downloads that you can just take down off the web um, and look at. So when you're digging up a, uh, a Roman tegula or imbrex, you can get some information on that. You can also get app. We can also create apps that can help with um, recording and knowledge. For example, taking us through uh, describing soils, working out the silt and sand content, um, how to fill out a context sheet or uh, standard operating procedures on how to take an archaeomag sample. So all of this can, has the potential to actually get people out on site, give them the information so that they can um, more readily, so that they can make better decisions about what they want to do. Now, a big part of any database is obviously the uh, data inputting. And this can be done on site if there is time. Although, whether it's a good thing to do it on site, I'll come on to in a second. The data inputting can be of site records, drawings, digital photographs, or of the finds and samples. And on some of the larger sites in London, London We'll have on-site processing where environmental and finds processing is done on-site and that can feed um, information back to the people digging and you can rush through spot dates or rush through a, a soil sample so you get information within potentially a day to inform your, your decision. Now we can also obviously input that stuff straight into a database so that we're, uh, we're not double handling our information. Um, now some units such as LP will um, input the entire contents of the context sheet onto, um, onto a database, whilst MOLA and other units will limit it to key fields, which may need to be inputted really by the supervisor because they're at a higher level of interpretation. All the data needs checking before data entry, or you just have to have another layer of checking after the data entry, and log jams can and do occur with data entry. Um, subgrouping, we talked about the, uh, the aggregation of context into subgroups and groups. This, this technically should be independent of finds and sample data, so it can actually be done on site. Um, once the sequence is understood, you can't do it on a context by context basis as you dig the site, but once you've gone down and you've worked your way through part of the sequence, you can actually go back and then aggregate your context into subgroups. Um, and actually, getting archaeologists, the diggers on site who are digging, the sequences, they don't normally get to do the subgrouping, getting them to actually do the subgrouping themselves will actually benefit them and benefit the site record and the quality of the record because they're actually going to start thinking about how what they're digging, they're going to start thinking about that as, a, as, a, as part of a sequence rather than just a series of individual contexts. Um, it helps develop their post skills and their understanding of the site. Um, 
we can look at the various other codes which we apply to the context and we can look at whether we can actually get the excavators on site to apply those codes themselves rather than the supervisor doing it later. Although grouping and higher level aggregations obviously need to wait for specialist input. Um, digitising can also be done on site and LP archaeology do a lot of digitising <coughs> in kind of real time on their larger excavations in London if there's space and time. And a lot of these sites, you may have a site which lasts for half a day and you're going down to look at the installation of a new public toilet on Leadenhall Street where they dig a small pit to connect to the sewer. You might take a few records and it's all done in that. You're not going to be sat on the side of the trench digitising your records for that. And any system has to actually be able to cope with that type of site in the same way as um, the current excavations are Butler's Creek House on the Walbrook, which have been going so far for I think about six months. They've got over 50 people working on there and loads of cabins and have got the room and the time for IT support on site. If you can digitise on site, then you can update your GIS in almost real time. Um, the only downside to this is that due to the complex sequences there can be significant time lags before records can be submitted, checked and digitising. And digitising can be a real pinch point in post-excavation. Um, as I said, it's far less efficient to check records and do data entry without the digitised plans and CAD or GIS. Um, and if you're trying to digitise everything you might actually need to have everyone out on site. So it depends on a flexible workforce. Um, there's also issues with programming. Um, we've got here the, the, the spike of work. Um, if you imagine that you, you, you have a large site, you recruit for that site, you have a large number of people on site. If you're doing all of your digitising and all of your data inputting on site, then as soon as the site finishes, you effectively have no more work. And you have to hope that there's another site to put those people on, or they will all have to go and find work somewhere else. Now, if you digitise off site, you can use that um, to actually make that spike have a longer tail so that you can keep your geometricians and some of your site staff in work whilst they actually um, uh, digitise everything while your spot dates are coming in so that you don't have this spike, then nothing, then spike. So it can be used to smooth out your workflow and that has issues on, um, on your, uh, obviously on your, your programme and your budgets and, and just employing people and retaining trained and skilled and um, keen staff. Um, And finally, we can do things nowadays with blogging and social media, which again can be very good for the staff on site with the caveat that not everybody wants to write a blog about what they're doing. Some people just want to get their heads down and dig a hole. Um, but some people do want to blog and um, it can actually get um, you know, good results from within site teams. Um, it can be very good PR for the client. Um, although it has to be noted that in London, due to the type of development, large, um, large developments, often for uh, financial houses, um, there's often embargoes on any um, public dissemination of archaeology and their findings until after the site is finished. Um, so you have to check quite carefully whether you're allowed to put up all those photos of uh, all the fantastic things you're finding. And it's obviously good for archaeology and it informs and educates the public and you can pitch it at multiple levels as LP are doing um, with the forthcoming Minaries project. So you've got at, you're reaching out to people either on the basic, look we found something really shiny um, level um, or you can put a bit more background and historical background and, and context into that up to having actual academic references. So what we're really doing with some of this is we're bringing some of the post-ex processes into the excavation. This allows more staff to see the post-ex processes and to become aware of the bigger picture, which is obviously good for them, provides them a valuable insight for them, um, as well as being good training, whether they want to be promoted or not. Um, it's always good to know what happens next in any process. Um, now, for the moment, any changes to the existing systems 
need to be additional layers um, or complementary rather than um, replacements because as I said despite all the huge excavations like spittle fields over the road and poultry, Buckleby House, um, most sites are a small size and short duration um, and we need to keep the flexible, <coughs> the flexible um, approach. Um, if you train up a load of people to use um, uh, kind of tablets and input all of their context de details on tablets and then you chuck them out on a watching brief and they've got a bit of paper given to them, it's going to be quite difficult for them to, to flip from one type of excavation recording strategy to another. You have to bear that in mind. Now throughout all of this, the temptation is there to try and use technology to save time and money. Um, budgets are always very tight. Um, it doesn't really matter that the building may be worth £400 million, archaeology is always going to be squeezed. Um, and with competitive tendering, people are always going to be looking to, to where they can save time and money. And the overwhelming thing is that it, in, in, the in the city particularly, but in London generally, it's all about the programme of work on site. People want you in and out as quickly as possible. They don't want archaeologists there for five months if they can get you in there with four times the number of people for two weeks. Um, so there are pressures on time to train staff just in the traditional skills that we need for excavating sites let alone new skills involving technology, which needs to be tested and, um, and rolled out and can break down sometimes. So any new systems need to be seen in terms of their overall impact, positive or negative, on the quality of work and on the existing well-established systems. Because those systems may not be, although they're completely compatible with GIS and databases, they may not be as adaptable as first thought to um, some things which we may come up with as ideas. And they may actually take a lot more time um, than at first thought to actually um, carry out a new technology um, recording system. And finally, it does need to be noted that many of these tasks are technically post-excavation tasks, not site, start, site tasks. So there's a budgeting implication as well. Because generally we put, in a, we put in a tender and that says that we're going to be charging this much for the excavation phase, this much for the assessment phase, and this much for publication and archive. And if you're starting to take money out of the assessment phase and spend in the uh, excavation phase, then things can start unravelling very quickly in terms of uh, finding out that you don't actually have any money left to actually publish the book or, God forbid, put the archive into the lark. Um, so we need to keep on top of all of, uh, all of this. So I'd just like to kind of use a, a case study, um, which is the use of digital site registers with um, LP Archaeology, which is basic, basically using iPods. You can see the iPods sitting there, um, just about ready to potentially fall down a three meter deep hole. Um, the iPods were um, used uh, in rubber dyes cases, um, which are, they are obviously expensive, but there are other alternatives. Um, and there are obviously issues with site conditions um, in that um, you of, often have a lot of dust, a lot of mud, a lot of water, and a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with batteries recharging. But over the years, we've now got used to using GPS, to using EGMs, and actually dealing with all of these problems on site. So actually having um, iPads or other data loggers out there for this purpose um, can actually, I don't really see that there are problems that I would have thought there were five years ago. And it generally worked very well. And all of your... Um, your, we use these for all of our registers, so our context registers, section registers, plan registers, small fine registers, sample registers. Those are all characterised by having very simple types of data, and it's generally drop-down lists. So all you're doing is selecting. There isn't really a great deal of higher level interpretation in here, but if you look at the context sheet, a large amount of that is all made up of cross-referencing from sections to context to plans. Most of the sample sheet is actually a copy of the context sheet. If you're chucking all the stuff into the database in the register, you can take those, um, those fields 
and that means that you don't actually need to input those at a, at a later date. We were using two iPads consecutively, they were linked by Wi-Fi to uh, an LP ARC database, and it worked very well. The only thing that I'd love to see um, is to see a camera where you could actually input the photo record into the camera so that you took a photo and you just typed into the back of the camera, it's a southwest facing photograph of context X and they would all be linked through. Um, but it, it does work, unfortunately the iPad's photo uh, capabilities aren't good enough to produce archive quality um, photographs and the lens is obviously not fantastic. Um, but it, it generally did work um, very well on site and um, I think it's a possibility of uh, taking this forward. Um, the last thing that I would point out is that we can develop all kinds of nice apps for tablets and phones, but if you try and use them on most construction sites in London, you'll get kicked off site because you're not allowed to use a mobile phone on site. So um, that's one last thing to think about. Thank you. <laughs>